Hello, I'm Paul Stankard at Salem Community College's Samuel H. Jones Glass Education Center, where we hold the annual International Flameworking Conference. Since 2001, master artists from around the globe have demonstrated their talent here in the spirit of sharing with our students and conference attendees. We've recorded these demonstrations so students and glass enthusiasts can be inspired by these featured artists. This collection of video demonstrations is now being offered to you through Salem Community College's exclusive master's series. Shane Farrow's generous spirit has influenced the contemporary glass community through his artwork, teaching, and volunteering. Shane's leadership qualities and his love of giving back led him to serve as the president of the Glass Art Society for two terms. Shane's work is influenced by his love of philosophy, nature, ancient Egyptian mythology, and surrealism. Shane has broken away from traditional vessel decoration techniques to use furnace glass and freeform designs. He has developed a fresh approach by adding colored shards in glass enamels to the hot bulbous shapes, which move him beyond the standard line and dot design. Shane brings sophisticated techniques to his glass work, such as acid etching to enhance colors, acrylic paint, and fused gold leaves. He also uses sandblasting to add dimension and visual information to the surface. Here, Shane Firo demonstrates at the 2009 International Flameworking Conference. Um, I'm going to be working with um, a kind of glass here. This is uh, a lead-based glass, but it could be a, a soda lime glass or a barium-based glass. It's used for neon. And uh, one reason that I like to use it is because um, it's inexpensive. You can still find it for about $1.50 a pound, which uh, beats borosilicate. And also because of the materials that are compatible with it, which are the same glasses you would use for the hot shop, which would be like Kugler and Zimmerman, Reichenbach, Gaffer, Wiesenthal Hoot. There's all kinds of different companies that make 100 to 200 colors. And all those are compatible with the lead glass. Of course, I also work with bullseye or borosilicate or whatever. Um, any kind of material can be flame work. During the World Wars, when people didn't have much glass to flame work, they took uh, glass bottles and broke them out especially the colored glass ones, and they pulled them into rods and made their materials from that. You could use float glass, you can use, uh, you can use even Pyrex, um, cook, cooking ware for color. So anyways, feel free to ask me any questions as I'm going along. Um, and uh, we'll just go from there. First thing I'm going to do is uh, pull a point, which is how you start in general with a uh, blown vessel or form. For the most part I'll be sitting, but I like to stand because get tired of sitting all the time.
Interesting enough, probably know I live near uh, Penland, North Carolina in the mountains. I found out that we have really high grade quartz there that's used for semiconductors and turns out that some of the quartz is so high grade that uh, put into this glass which is made in Danville, Kentucky. Another kind of glass that um, they're switching to, especially in Europe, it's made in Europe, is a barium-based glass that has good brilliance like lead glass. It's supposed to be greener, but I don't think barium is much better than lead. Normally when you're working with powders, you should have a ventilation system in front of you. I like the snorkel kind, that's what I have in my studio. If you want to know specifically what colors I'm using, um, this is Reichenbach 108. It's a silver color and it kind of strikes. A lot of the bead people really like that color. So having a long career, you make, uh, you go through different color periods like Picasso, the blue period, whatever. Um, lately I've gotten more into, not that I'm do, not doing bright colors, but I've gotten into a lot of earth tones again. And part of that's due to my environment and traveling, especially in Japan, but also flying over Australia and looking at the uh, arid landscape with browns and reds. And okay. Yes? Are you using a, a powder or a very fine thread? It's a powder or talc. She asked if I'm using a powder like, or a, like a really fine frit. Well, when it gets down to this level, they actually call it like gaffer, which is made in New Zealand, they call it talc. But we, we call it powder. Most of the work that I do, I approach in more of a painterly fashion. I think of myself as doing miniature paintings on the surface, drawing.
With this kind of glass, I'm using pretty low pressure. Um, I usually use five pounds or less of propane and uh, not more than 10 pounds of pressure of oxygen. Which saves on energy and saves on money. I'm going to be using some uh, Kugler 95, which is an op opal black. And I have uh, the last powder I'm going to put on is some um, Kugler 124, which is a red. I've blown uh, <clears throat> some color plugs into shards, which will add some decoration.
You're awfully quiet. So you're asking, there's a difference between glass pigments and pigments in paints, right? Because of chemistry. Right. Well, a lot of that is just from exper experience, using the colors and seeing what they do and how they interact with each other. Um, I think there is a lot of similarity between paints, pig, pigments of paints and the colors. I mean, because a lot of them are the same exact oxides. And, uh, and in fact, you can use a lot of um, ceramic um, glazes for this glass as well, and it works pretty well. So I think it's just a matter of experimenting and seeing how they interact. And the surface tensions are different, so they spread apart, or they're soft, or they're hard. And you kind of got to know what's going to happen when you're working with them. Does that sort of answer it, or not really? Mm-hmm. Well, that could be true. I mean, I think that, um, as I was saying last night, I like to inform my glass from painting and going back and forth. It's pretty interesting to try to match paints on a canvas with what the glass is, but, you know, you can do it. Well, it certainly makes for a lot of fun. But you know, for example, if you, if you take a blue glass, say a blue glass powder, and you put it over a yellow glass powder that you already laid down, what do you get? Green, it's like if you're mixing paints. So there's a lot of overlap.
So I'm working very thin, so I have to melt all this glass down. Of course, the different colors I put on have different um, surface tensions. So I have to deal with that issue. Some are a little softer, some are a little harder. I'm just necking this down. This will be the bottom of the bubble. Yes. Well, generally I started the, she's asking if I always use powders rather than just putting rods on. Originally I just used rods, that was our tradition in our family, but um, generally I, I do like, um, the look of solid color. Um, I'm not really looking for a glassy sort of look anyway, so that's another issue. Does that answer your question? Sort of. I don't use many frits, to be honest, um, at least in this process, because they're all uniform looking. I don't like that look. I'd rather give it a frit look just by using the rods and just working it randomly.
And I'm going to make another part for this. It's going to be the foot. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, not not actually. She's asking about me not flashing the piece. Um, which isn't always the case. I might um, flame and eel parts of it, which I'm going to actually do with this. But if, if you know that it doesn't have a lot of stress in it, it's better not to be flashing it because the heat flows through the piece as you're making it and it's cooling down as it's supposed to. If you've ever watched Lucio Babaco work and uh, do the same thing with my figures, you start with the thickest portion of the body and then you just let that cool and you move out, outward from that. You don't go back in and try to flash it like you would in a glory hole. Because a lot of times that's shocking it, you know. Right. Yeah, it wasn't what I was looking for, so I just redid it. So I'm going to cover this with some black powders. I think you asked if I put powders inside of the tubes. Um, no, not too much really. Uh, I mean, I've like made colors like that, putting oxides inside of tubes. I guess I fooled around with it a little bit. Another thing you could do actually is to cover one tube with one, whatever designs you want, and then slip it inside of another tube so it's cased. I find that interesting, but it doesn't necessarily serve my purposes.
when I was a kid, we, we didn't really have glass powders. So what we did is we took glass rods and we smashed them in a burlap sack with a hammer. And then put them into one of those hand, like sausage grinders, meat grinders, side of a table, and grind up those, and then just keep grinding them till they got finer and finer and then sift them out. That's pretty nice to be able to just go to the local glass store and buy powders. Yeah, where is the music? I'm not used to this quietude. I really listen to everything. Um, jazz, blues, rock hip-hop, classical, bluegrass. You know, there's a, there's a musicality to working like this because the hand movements you make and the breath control are similar to instruments, so very akin to music, I think. So I'm going to add this to this point here. Stuff stays pretty fluid all for a while. It's not like Moretti or borosilicate or bullseye or that's kind of one of the good points about it, I think.
So when you do a foot, you should try to start from the rim. And don't go back up into the bubble, get it too hot because you'll lose control of it. I'm slowly going to bring the heat back from that rim into the bubble so it opens up. By hanging it like this and turning it opens it up. When I come in on the side of it, I'm just trying to even up the lip. Now one of the crucial things about this soft glass, if you did, if you put the foot down on a cold surface like graphite with borosilicate, probably nothing would happen. But if there's even like one grain of powder on that and I put that foot down on it, it would crack it. You gotta make sure that surface is clean. Now I'm gonna flame anneal this with just straight propane or you could use straight natural gas. And this will take the stress out of it. When the uh, carbon forms on the uh, surface of this foot, it means that we've gone below the strain point of the glass and the carbon builds up on it. And uh, you know you're in pretty good shape. I usually go about two minutes. Now you have all this soot, so that's not good. So you have to have a hood system to get that soot out. Over in uh, Europe, especially in Germany, they still do a lot of flame annealing. And uh, if you go in their studios, there's soot all over the place. Now this isn't gonna take the place of this piece being properly annealed at the end. It's just a temporary measure. Now, the inverse of this is true. If you wanted to heat up a piece, you could use straight propane or natural gas, and it'd take a little while. But as the piece warms up and you can actually feel it close to your lips, the temperature of the glass, then you could add oxygen to the flame very, very slowly. And of course, all the carbon will dissipate, and you know you've gone above the strain point of the glass. And actually, straight propane or straight um, natural gas will not crack a piece because it's, it doesn't shock it. It's when you add oxygen or air to it is when it shocks it. So like if you had a big marble and you wanted to heat that up, um, you could take that marble and heat it up in straight propane. It would take you a long time to get it hot. But it's a good way to, uh, to deal with those kind of things. Just using the flame Okay, I'm gonna, I got some plugs in there. I know a lot of you have seen this, but, you know, these companies make rods for 
flame workers or lamp workers now, but they didn't used to. So you had to pull your own rods. And I, I still do that because I like to be able to determine what size of a rod I want. So I can pull my own to whatever diameter. If I need a big one, I used to use a larger chunk. I bring these up to temperature about, um, oh, some of the softer colors, about 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if they're reds, yellows, or oranges, I usually go up to 1050. And I also let these soak for about 15 to 20 minutes at least. So the interior of, the, of this chunk of glass is hot all the way through. Because if it's not, when you go to pull it into a rod and it cracks, then you're going to have air bubbles, air striations running through your rods. So I'm going to be looking for kind of like a football shape here. This is an enamel white from Gaffer. It's also nice to be using these materials if you do work, combination work with uh, furnace glass, you're using the same materials. So. So these uh, rods, the punnies, are borosilicate, so they'll just pop off there, and you just make sure the ends are cleaned up. I'm just going to set this over here. Okay, now I'm going to do uh, blow out a shard. Let's see that. I know some of you have seen this before, but some of you haven't, so.
Now this is a nice red and uh, basically the selenium colors and the cadmium colors, reds, yellows, and oranges should be worked way out here in the torch and not close to the torch head or you'll boil it or discolor it. You can also take uh, two or three colors and stack them, and so when they blow out, you have beautiful shards. So when you lay them down on a piece, like it's one that has uh, white on one side and black on the other. So when you lay this down on a piece, the melts in, so the black rims around the white. So this is cool, cool down. A little excitement over there, huh? <laughs> now I have a nice footing tool here that came from the families that I learned from. You don't see these too often. What it is is uh, three-pronged. This is uh, good rake steel. And the center point goes up, it's graphite tipped, goes up in the apex of there, the foot. It's pretty lightweight. Hmm? No, no company sells it. I wish they did. I'm get, I've been trying to get them to make it. I have a great fabricator. You know, great factory? Fab fabricator. Fabricator? That would be good. There's a lot of really cool tools that they make in Germany that um, Fred Burkhill brought back in the 80s. and. A lot of the companies that have them now are actually ones that we gave them designs or modified. And some of them really aren't available really with the normal companies that supply flame working tools. Okay, so we're going to finish this uh, top off here.
It's 124 Kugler. Kugler has a lot of really good reds now. 126, 123, chili pepper, lava, poppy red. Probably within the last 10 years, uh, most of the companies that manufacture colors have really done wonders with their reds. They used to be difficult to find. Pardon? I'm wearing glasses, but I'm not wearing didiniums. I don't usually wear didiniums when I'm working soft glass. Make a little spout here. What's that? It's going to be a little bird sitting on the lip.
Now I'm going to put a handle on this. 